Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us on iTunes right now, please go and leave a five-star review. They can say anything. I will be reading the best reviews every week so long as they are five stars. So let it rip, guys. I appreciate all the good reviews so far. Uh, quick shout out to our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Cushy Dreams. If you've listened to the episode before, you've heard me talk about them. Cushy Dreams is basically the place to go for quality CB smokable CBD products. They specialize in pre-roll joints and extraordinary smokable flower, aka bud, which comes in these sealed like tin cans. Everything is the the quality is through the roof. And you can see all of this on their website, cushydreams.com. They have a whole section on their website about lab results. They're constantly testing for compliance and purity. And what I love, I mean, I love these products because I, you know, I would smoke weed like pretty often, but I would, I would get too high. I don't know if I had a sensitivity to it, but I would get way too high. And I often would not have a productive day, but that's what I love about Cushy Dreams. It's you take a couple, for me, I take a couple puffs. I immediately feel relaxed. My body feels relaxed and I can kind of, you know, go on with my day and get things done. Uh, and the best part about it, they have so many different indica sativa blends, uh, like create dream energy hustle, really kind of whatever you want to do with your day. Cushy Dreams has, um, has a product for you. So if you go to their website, cushydreams.com and you use the promo code CMP, you're going to get 20% off your entire order plus free shipping. Check it out. I love, I love these guys, these guys products. Um, it's just really changed my life. And now I'm kind of like a more chill person. Uh, really quick. I have some stand up dates coming up. Yes, guys. Yes. Uh, uh, March 20th comedians of the compound comes back to Tiff's ale house in, uh, Morris Plains, New Jersey. And then I'm heading to Florida doing the Boca black box on April 30th. That's with Tim young. And that's in Boca Raton, Florida. And then May 1st, I'm going to be at the Lake Park Black Box Theater in Palm Beach, Florida, also with Tim Young. Then on May 2nd, we'll be at Side Splitters in Tampa, also with Tim. And then we're going uh, on May 7th and 8th to the Skyline Comedy Club in Appleton, Wisconsin. May 9th, Oklahoma City, that's the Bricktown Comedy Club. And then Comedians of the Compound is heading to Austin, Texas, May 14th and 15th. Then on May 18th, I'll be at Zany's in Nashville with Tim Young, May 19th, Stand Up Live in Huntsville, Alabama, also with Tim Young, and then June 3rd, Hilarities in Cleveland with, you guessed it, Tim Young. For, for more details and tickets, please go to my website, chrissymayer.com. I will keep it as updated as I possibly can. Also, another quick shout out to our other sponsor, Lucy. Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. These products were researched and developed for three years to be made for people, not patients. Lucy has created a nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, and pomegranate. They also have a lozenge, if you prefer that lozenge life. Each and every flavor actually tastes great. It's convenient, discreet. These products can be enjoyed anywhere on flights, at work, on the go, even, even in the gym, even in the gym, who's going to the gym? Me very soon. <laughs> it's 2021. It's time to get rid of your cigarettes, unplug your vape, throw out your dip and get you some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each and every month. It's so simple. You don't have to leave your house. Uh, for all my CMP listeners, go to lucy.co, that's lucy.co, and use the promo code CMP. You're going to get 20% off all products, including gum or lozenges. That's lucy.co. Use the promo code CMP at checkout. And I have to give this disclaimer, warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco, and nicotine is an addictive chemical. You know what else is addictive? Savings. So go to lucy.co, use that promo code CMP, save your money. Save your money, guys. Uh, I'm so excited to have this gal on the podcast today. Uh, she, I, I, uh, I've been kind of a fan for a while and she recently did, uh, in hot water, which is a, a show run by 
Gino Bisconti and Aaron Berg on Compound Media. I'm uh, very good friends with those guys. So I was excited to see her there. And I'm excited to have her here today. Um, she, like myself, former SJW, she is the host of uh, the co host of Unsafe Space on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your fine podcasts. She is the founder of Civility Dinners. Uh, Carrie Smith, welcome to the show. Hi, Chrissy. Thanks for having me. I am so glad you're here. We're here. I'm so <laughs> meeting another former SJW is a lot like um, going to an AA meeting. It, we, we just have a lot of unspoken things we understand. <laughs> it really feels that way. And at no point, just I was locked in for years of being like, oh, of course, this is the right way to think. Like, if you don't think this way and believe what I believe, like, you're somehow a caveman. You're somehow like not evolved. You somehow like, why do you hate gays? You know, um, clearly you didn't go to college. Like for years, I very much kind of looked down at people who didn't go to college. And then I realized, oh, college is a scam. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had that. There is quite a bit of arrogance, at least in my case. Also, there's a lot of arrogance that's built into probably in any kind of orthodoxy, maybe mm. the one that I happen to be in was this social justice one, but maybe in any kind of fundamentalism, there's this built in arrogance that like, you know, the truth, you know, the way the world really works and you're so smart because you figured it out and all yep. these dumb, you know, plebes who don't get it. Uh, and, and now I feel that. that way, but just in a different way. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> have, I, have I evolved at all? I just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like on the other side of it. I don't know. I don't know if I wouldn't say that I'm like an opposite. I, I think like you, I am also a classical liberal. I just think that over the years, like what it means to be a liberal has like really been changed and distorted. Yeah. Um, it used to be like, yeah, you're friends with gay people. You don't care who people have sex with or marry. Um, you're all for like, of course, like inclusivity as, as so far as, people are qualified to do the job. It, it wasn't like this looks are more important than um, the qualities yeah. of the person. Yeah. It, it's also, you know, you, you probably are in the arts or to people who are, you know, you're more liberalism has really, um, I think gotten away from its roots in part because this, this totalitarian sort of authoritarian belief system has, has grown out of the side of it like a parasite. That's the way James Lindsay describes it. He's like, it's a parasite on the tree of liberalism. Wow. And it's like another, it's like a growth. Yes. <laughs> it's like, yes. It's coming out of my neck. <laughs> <laughs> and so people, people, at least I did, it gets sold to you as liberalism, as progressivism, but it's not. And like people become very disconnected, I think, from really thinking deeply about what words mean. And so, um, if you say I'm a liberal, but you support censorship, well, you don't even, you're so disconnected from what liberal means that like, you're not speaking truth, but you're probably not even aware of it because you haven't really even thought about what does it mean to be a liberal? Um, liberalism is open-minded. Liberalism is for free expression. Uh, liberalism is not this sort of cancerous cancel culture censorship uh, fundamentalist puritanical they're very there's, there's a lot like pure they're puritans but on the left um it's it's none of this so. I re yeah i remember it this came up maybe more like a couple years ago but the idea that if somebody like was not attracted to a trans person or, or would not consider hooking up or having sex with a trans person you were somehow like automatically deemed transphobic and i'm just like oh man like we're, we're kind of going backwards like what happened to people liking who they like and love is love and and like you know it's like you, you would never force a gay person to be straight or to, to do you know what i mean like you would never be like no you have to be open to everything it's like I, people well they're they are we are we will be approaching that place <laughs> soon. <laughs> I think you're right. We would not have done that. But now I know, um, you know, we hear from on our show on an unsafe space, we've occasionally talk and talk to um, trans folks who are not social justice or um, lesbians who've talked about this, this, uh, how this new orthodoxy, at least around ideas of gender and sex 
is now pushing lesbians out to some degree because it used to be that you could grow up and you could be a, a masculine woman. You could be butch. You could even be attracted to women and you're just considered a lesbian. But now they're like, Oh, are you sure you're not a man? Don't you want to be in a straight relationship? Like, Whoa. shouldn't you like, <laughs> if you're masculine, you must be a man. And especially for little kids, like think about what this does to, to girls who are growing up, who don't fit the stereotype and of what a woman should be. It used to be that that's okay. And, you know, feminism was fighting for, there's a, a many different types of expression of, of, of being a woman. There's not just one kind of way to be a woman. And feminism was about at least, you know, second wave and third wave to some extent was about fighting against these, these gender stereotypes. And now we're at a place where it's like, no, no, the gender stereotypes are true. If you don't fit into them, then you're the other sex. Wow. Right. Cause like whatever happened to just straight up, like, why can't we have like butch lesbians anymore? And I, I don't know who is, maybe it, it happens just like within the group, like who, who would be giving these butch lesbians the feeling like, Oh, don't you want to transit? Like, that's crazy to me. Like, yeah, I think it's just in the schools. It's like, it's sort of, so it used to be, you know, of course you're talking about gender dysphoria, which is, which is affects less than 1% of the population. So you've got, you've got this thing that affects a very small percentage of the human population that we are now teaching in a lot of elementary schools. They're starting to teach about, and they're telling a hundred percent of kids, you need to figure out what your gender identity is. Whereas in the past, 99.9% .9 of these kids never had to have address that question. Now it's a question that we're putting into children's heads is this is how, this is what humans do. You just, you figure this out. And and we're kind of ignoring the fact that when you introduce a question like that to children, you're obviously going to get a larger percentage of kids who are now saying, oh, well, maybe I am. I mean, I'm so glad I wasn't super tomboy, but I was definitely tomboy in some regard, in some respects. And I'm so happy I didn't grow up now because I feel like I might have been getting messaging coming at me from a lot of different directions telling me that I should question whether I'm actually a woman or not. You know? Yeah, I was feeling like boys were <clears throat> gross. All like, well, <laughs> through college, you know, like, and I was kind of a tomboy. Oh, tomboy too. Um, I like grew up. I was like very sporty, and I was like flat for a while. Like I didn't really, you know, whatever. <laughs> like get my period. Till I was like fourteen. Whatever. I was very much like I was. I remember because I had a girlfriend who was like, Chrissy, why don't you have your period yet? <laughs> like <laughs> you, she was like, you should walk around school wearing a pad. Like we all have to do. Like she shamed me for like, and I was like, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I'm she Norwegian. She made you feel like it wasn't cool. She made me feel like, ah, uh, there was, yeah, that I'm I wrong. somehow like needed to make up for the fact that I like wasn't menstruating yet. I'm like, oh man. And I still talk to that girl. It sounds like someone I would have never talked to again, but like we still chat. And I just think it, it was just what a crazy thing. Right. But right. Like you, like I was a tomboy, like really into sports. I was not like, I was aware of boys, but I wasn't like, oh God, I have a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. I just was like, and I, and I think it's, it really sucks because I think kids are so much smarter than it seems like they're being given credit for right now. Like you don't, kids figure that stuff out, you know, like they, they figure out, you know, maybe, I don't know, third, fourth grade. Okay. Like I like this girl or I like this boy. It's like, it doesn't have to be like that really. I don't know. Like let kids be kids, like their sexuality, like will be made aware to them when it's made aware to them. Like, hello, that's what like being a teenager, I think yeah. is about when you're just like, Oh God. Yeah. Like I, I really, you know, you're probably they quite let you bit, know. You're probably younger than me, but uh, quite a bit younger. But did you ever do? We had a we in fifth grade and stuff. The the confusing time of figuring things out for us involved going together, which often mm. meant you would get a note from like the guys' friends would give a note to your girlfriends, and then you would check a box saying yes, I do want to go with you. But then go you, with you. Oh, you didn't wait, necessarily no, interact. <laughs> I'm I'm 37, so I don't know. Maybe we're like okay. I'm a little bit older. Yeah, I'm 32. Uh, so the I I just think back on that kind of innocence of uh, figuring that stuff out, and I I think it's it's just so different now. Now you're getting instruction sometimes in 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 pre-K, but you're getting instruction on things like the gingerbread man, you know. And these are all the parts uh, of your identity, and you need to figure this out, children. And 
I'm not saying we need to shield kids from their sexuality, but I I think that's something you don't need to teach that. I think they're going to, they're really going to figure that out. (laughs) Like give them confidence in, in regular ways and encourage them and give them love and support. And, and that stuff will figure itself out. Like I, I think I was like first grade and, uh, not even that this was a boyfriend because this guy ended up becoming gay. <laughs> of course, like <laughs> like so many of the people that I end up dating, <laughs> they go, oh, after I date Chrissy, I know I need to make a, f- a hard right turn. Um, yeah, I think we were like, we were behind a bookcase, me and Johnny Meyer, and we were with our fifth grade buddies. And I don't know what happened. We just sort of like fell into each other. Like, I don't even know if you want to call it a kiss. I don't even, I'm not even counting it as my first kiss, but we were just like, <laughs> like, like it's, it's so cute how kids kind of like don't know what to do even yeah. like my legit first kiss i was 14 phil g marino we were at the pool and oceanside and like i it didn't occur to me to like use tongue i just like <laughs> all i knew from watching tv is like again kind of just like a flat mm-hmm. like like pr- uh, let's press our mouths against each other and then he was like i love you and i was like i love you too and we hugged because that's what we thought kissing was <laughs> so i don't know I, I think like the introduction of these topics like i don't know so soon is is it in a way almost getting these kids to think about more mature ideas before they're ready is that well, possible i mean I, I i think so i think absolutely i think we're we're shortening the amount of time that we're allowing children to be children and then who knows the effects of, of being online as, as young as kids are. I mean, I don't, we didn't grow up with that. So in a way, kids are guinea pigs. And one thing that I know that has been happening since these devices became ubiquitous and in our hands all the time, um, suicide rates for children, for teenagers and children have climbed. And among young girls, especially, um, wow. there's a documentary out right now. I think it's still out. I think it's on Netflix. It's the social dilemma. I don't know if you've seen that one. <gasps> yes, I have seen the social dilemma. Yeah. It's re- it was really good. It, yeah. yeah, it was very interesting. I thought they got they had a few blind spots when it came to political persuasion through you know I, I felt like they just had a few a few blind spots probably because most of the people making it are squarely on the left and they maybe needed a more diverse range of people politically. But in terms of just what the technology does. And what the psychologically, how we get addicted to these these apps and how they, uh, you know, these devices and how they uh, figure out how to advertise to us better and to keep us using them longer. That was all very fascinating. And the that's where I started. I think I first heard that stat about children and yeah. how it coincided with the introduction of, of phones, because now you've got kids growing up on on devices. Oof. And I, what stuck out to me was like that somehow, and I always like, you know, you meet your dad or dad's friend or who, some kooky adult who like puts the uh, index card, like a post it over the camera. And I was like, those people are weird. Like on their computer, <laughs> like they cover up their camera. I'm like, oh, come on. You're superstitious. Like it's not, it, they're not coming to get you. And then in the social dilemma, they talk about like, yeah, the camera and your phone somehow, like it's, it's somehow always on. And it's like monitoring, monitoring your facial expression at all times so it knows how you're reacting to what you're seeing and I was just like oh my god these kooky people were right you know you know when I started covering up my camera was when there was a picture that got that was leaked of uh or it wasn't leaked it was a part of an interview but I don't I don't think that he realized this was in the photo it was a picture of Mark Zuckerberg at work and behind him in the background was his laptop and you could see he had a sticker over the camera and he also had a um the end of a of a headphones plugged in and cut off you know to stop it from yeah and so at that point i was like if zuckerberg hey hold the freaking phone so hold the phone so that i'm wearing so let's say this is like the inside of the computer yeah like literally he just had it plugged in like yeah, that, and, and then this the was wire. cut off. <gasps> yeah, that'll stop it. Yeah, you what? can see that when with did, any. Yeah. When did you see that? That was a few years ago. And then I started, I was like, so whenever I'm not using it, I'll plug just to make sure. <laughs> I wanted to, oh, I laugh my God, this, Terry. Your this needs friend. to be. <sighs> yeah, the older people. I used to I used to laugh too at my, oh, that, make, that reminds me. So way back in the day, I don't know, like uh, maybe 
maybe 10 or maybe 15 years ago, I had an aunt and uncle who were very skeptical about being online and they didn't like sending certain types of things in email. And they were really sort of, we just try and keep all of our personal information offline. And they didn't, they did not create social media accounts. And, and I remember thinking like, they're oh, they're so, so happy. paranoid. Yeah. Yeah. They're so paranoid. What's wrong with them? And now flash forward all these years later, I'm like, wow, they were, um, what an interesting you know, they, they were protecting themselves against things they couldn't even understand, you know, in yeah. some ways I'm sort of like, they were ahead of the curve. How old were they? How old were these people? Um, they're in their seventies now. Wow. So this must've been, yeah, like maybe 15, more than 15 years ago, it's but so they didn't like email or anything. Go ahead. That's interesting. Whereas like my dad, who's in his seventies and like, opted out but because he like didn't know how to do it but he like would pretend he didn't care but i feel like deep down he like didn't really want to learn how to do it and i, I remember like i set him up with an email address and, and i'd be like uh, he just would always forget his ipad password and i should i should talk i'm constantly <laughs> forgetting my passwords but like he kind of didn't involve himself in social media because like he didn't know and he didn't want to learn. And he was like either uh, his whole life, a landscaper or a teamster, like never in a job that needed any social media whatsoever. And we were kind of like forced into it. Like I remember, yeah, like my space, but I definitely remember Facebook coming out when I was like a junior or senior in college. And I was just like, Oh, right. It was like a way to connect with other people at your school. And then it was everybody. And then it's just like, Oh, okay. Like, it's all of it. It's it's like, yeah, you do want to post like cute pictures of yourself and get yeah. that validation and get that feedback. And I just remember like the early days, it would you would just leave like, you know, a little like aim t style away message like on your on your Facebook or something. And uh, yeah. I don't know, it was it's changed so much. And I just feel like it's we're all frogs in boiling water in terms of social media. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. But, and, and we don't there's so much of 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 our life now or in society now that I think maybe it's always been this way. And we just, we just, maybe humans just tend to look at whatever current moment in history we're in. We tend to look at it as unique, but maybe there's always to a certain degree, we're just frogs in boiling water. We're just guinea pigs figuring things out, new technologies and, you know, and it's good. Like I, I think back, I'm like, I think my mom, I always make jokes. Like I think my mom took five photos of me growing up, you know, like I was the third child. Um, just like, she just was, I don't know. She was just busy with three kids. And now it's like, you have wow. parents who are like, Oh, we've got, you know, a book made of every month of our kid's life and like so many photos and it's all online, which is nice for, you know, if you keep it private, your friends and family see. So on one hand, it is great. Cause I feel like there is more documentation going on, but it's, but it's like, and the, and the social dilemma kind of delved into this, like, oh, okay, well now that we're in it, how do we, how do we like cut off? And it's almost like I'm watching this movie going like, come on, guy, anybody who works in, in social media or big tech, they're not going to be like, let's look for ways to make less money and take less advantage of people. It's like, right. okay, let's figure out how to make our product less addictive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, not going to happen. Uh, like let's let's no more nudity on Twitter. Okay, sure. <laughs> I um I remember I was I was reading you have like a, a you put out a piece, I think it was in 2017 about why you were leaving the left, and I thought it was like really interesting, and and it's it, there's like a dehumanizing element to it all, kind of. And I, and I, and I was like, wow, this sounds a lot like I was listening the other day to somebody who interviewed a woman who was like friends with Hitler. Like she was 103 years old and she personally knew Hitler. And yeah. she said, uh, you know how Hitler convinced us all like to hate the Jews, like how he first did it. <laughs> he truly convinced us that like the Jews were diseased. And once we believed that the rest was kind of easy. And I was like, yeah. wow, this sounds so similar to what's going on right now. Like all conservatives are just garbage people. Like anybody on the right, even center right is not a, not a human. And I was like, why, why yeah. are the, like, why is the left? So, They're the first people who to call someone a Nazi. How would they not see that they are kind of going down this Nazi type path? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> it's, um, it's actually, we did. Uh, we do. We have a book club at Unsafe Space. We do a book a month. We Ooh. we tend to alternate between fiction, and nonfiction, and 
on the nonfiction list, we, we did this book that Jordan Peterson recommended called Ordinary Men. Ordinary and if you men. haven't read this, I would definitely recommend it. It's a, it's a hard read in terms of uh. just like subject matter. <laughs> it's really, you know, the first half of it is just documenting. So it, it's about a, a police battalion, a reserve police battalion um, who became charged with executing just a very large number of Jews during the Holocaust. And so these are reserve police. These are people who are like dentists and doctors and, you know, they have other jobs, but they get called in to, and they get put in charge of just killing people. And the second half of the book kind of gets into the psychology behind how you get so-called ordinary men to participate in something so evil. How do you get large numbers of people? How, how does that happen? And, and the book is really eye-opening in my opinion, because it, it helped you better understand how we're not special. Hmm. I think, I think we tend to look at, again, like whatever moment of history we're in is sort of, we're uniquely intellectually evolved and emotionally evolved. And this, something like this would never happen again, because we're so smart and we're so morally evolved and we can look back at history and say, how did people do this? You know, we would never do this. We're, we would always be the one who would not and be a part of it. Right. Cause but you always want to think you're smarter than your parents. We're constantly yeah. evolving as people, you know, exactly. Yeah. The, the college thing for me, I was like, Oh, I'm better than anybody who didn't go to college. Like we're smarter than we were a hundred years ago. Plus. Yeah. Yeah. We have a, we have a, a, a humans can be very arrogant mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the arrogance can, I think can make us really blind to things. And so um, I started noticing that it, this in 2016, 2017 on the left, this, the, and that's what that essay that you mentioned was about, that I finally wrote this sort of coming out essay of leaving the social justice left because I started to notice on my so-called side this dehumanizing that was happening of conservatives where after the 2016 election, just everyone in my echo chamber was calling all Trump supporters, Nazis and white supremacists and calling Trump a white supremacist, which is ludicrous. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not jumping on this bandwagon now where we're supposed to all speak ridiculous lies and pretend like we all agree. I know that the, the Overton window has shifted to such a degree now, to such a degree now that, that we kind of are living, it feels to me anyway, that we're living in this um, pseudo reality where we accept certain things as fact and the media accepts certain things as fact um, and presents them as such without ever backing, giving evidence as to why they're true. They'll say things. I read the, a, a Guardian article the other day that said something about da 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 and Trump and his white supremacist base. And it's like, you just we're, say that like yeah. it's a fact. I can't believe we're still saying that. I can't believe yeah. like, like that's crazy. Ugh. And so I saw that happening in the social justice left. My side was saying simultaneously that, that these like 63 million voters were white supremacists and also that we should be punching Nazis, that these people are all Nazis and we should be punching Nazis. And I'm like, this is a, this is alarming. Like this is scary to me. And this is not what I signed up for because I don't believe in initiating force. I don't believe in violence unless, unless it's in self true self-defense. And I don't believe in, um, dehumanizing people to such a degree that you feel okay doing it. Cause then you feel like I'm the good guy. I'm on the right side of history. These guys are all evil. And therefore we can, we can, you know, punch them and we can call them deplorable and we can, um, without even realizing what we're doing, you know, who else thought they were the good guys, these guys, like <laughs> ordinary men. That's why that book is important is, is, um, is, is how else do you spot if you're being the, the unwitting puppet, of something evil. Mm -hmm. And if you've, if you've decided that that's impossible because you're on the side of good and you're not capable of, of evil, well then you're a person who scares me. <laughs> like if you're not aware of that, you're capable of yeah, all humans are capable of good and evil. Then if you think you're, you're just a good, I'm just a good person. Like, I don't really yeah. want to be around you. <laughs> and where does this leave most people? Cause I'm thinking like when I was sort of like stuck in that trance, like, yes, in college, I would, you know, I would, I was definitely, I was part of the students for social justice club because my, like my roommate was oh, wow. in it. My other roommate was in it. I was like, this is what we're all doing. Like I'm, I'm very much a like follow the leader wanted to be like 
part of the club. Like I, I very much like did not develop any kind of standing up for myself leadership skills until like mm, yesterday. So <laughs> I was very just like, oh, I went to a protest because I thought I was going to like meet cute guys. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know. I was like, oh, no, these are just future baristas. Like nobody here is like the type of man I'm going to be attracted to. Um but it was fun. You know, it builds character. But what does this thinking like ultimately do to most people? Because I think most people like they work, they have kids. Um, what does this thinking really do? Like you're not going to most people are not going to go to a protest. Like most people are not going to like I mean, I think most people are not going to go punch someone. They think that feels differently than them. I think ultimately it just creates like a private little hell for yourself mm -hmm. and it locks you in and it makes you small and it makes you less likely to say hello to somebody when you're out. Cause you, you size them up and you go up oh, camouflage uh, or American flag shirt. This person's probably conservative. I'm not going to hold the door for them. It's like, it's so insidious. And in little ways you're kind of just, you're closing yourself off from the world and yeah. just a little, even elevator interactions or whatever. And it's, it's ultimately just, I think just creating a small, like little cave for yourself and you're cutting yourself off from the world. And it's ultimately, I think harming just you, you know, cause I think the powers that be like, they don't really need us as individuals. They're, yeah. you know, perhaps we're pawns, but at the end of the day, it's like, uh, you got to just take back your life, like check in with yourself and be like, Oh, are, are these my beliefs or am I kind of, and I have to do that with myself too. Like, am I just not spouting off um, buzzwords or like catchphrases, you know, mm -hmm. from the people I follow and respect on whatever side I'm, I'm on. So it's so tricky. Cause it's like, Oh, what side am I on? Sometimes I get wrapped up in like, am I a classical liberal? Am I a libertarian? Like, am I a conservative? Lady, like I'm, i to completely feel you. <laughs> I have the same, don't worry about it. I would say, cause I, I mean, I had, I, I had those questions a lot at first cause people always want to ask you what box you're in or they want to put you in a box. And so I still, I can still consider myself a liberal, like a classical liberal, but uh, I also know I've become more conservative on some personal beliefs, not on policy beliefs really, but on, on the ways in which I believe I should live my life more conservative. And um, I just think, I think sometimes we, we get so, we get so wrapped up in, in fitting into one of these things and being able to define ourselves to other people. And it's, it's not, I don't know, it's not that, it's not that important. I'm still figuring it out too, I guess is the point, but, but there is a tendency to here, here's something I noticed immediately when I started leaving the social justice left is I did see some other people who left the social justice left or who, who left the left, who immediately became just as vocally mm. like Republican or pro Trump and not that there's anything wrong with that. I just really didn't want to, I wanted to make sure I didn't just become a mouthpiece for another type of tribalism. And so I've tried to, and I, and I get why that's attractive because as humans, we want to be part of a community and a tribe and it's hard being a nomad. And, right. Uh, Cause if you, if you were a cheerleader <laughs> yeah. for the left, you're okay. You're probably going to be a cheerleader for the right or a cheerleader right. for, uh, you know, you're just like, cause those are your strengths, right? If you're outspoken and you're confident mm -hmm. and you're like, Oh, well, you know, you really like to, you like to engage in debate or whatever, but I think yeah. it's good to keep in mind, like, what are you giving up, um, for in return, you get to be what, like part of a group? Like, what is that even really? It's like, it doesn't even exist. It's like, I think you're just like, I'm, I'm part of a group, but it only exists online. It's not like these people meet up. It's just like, you have people who yes and some you on social media. I know did start to like, like some of the walkaway people are very, um, they're not, it's not just wa about walking away. It's also about walking too. And mm. I spoke at one of the walkaway events, but uh, oh, cool. in general, I felt like this is, this is, uh, it's a very specific, it's a walking to movement as well, which is fine. It's just that there's a whole range of ways you can walk away that don't necessarily involve becoming a Republican or voting mm. for Trump. Now I did happen to vote for him this past time, which is funny because in 2016, I was one of those people crying when he won. Me too. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent the same as you in that respect. And I've, and I've told this story on other episodes, but like, I remember it was 2016. Um, I was like, 
hanging out with my boyfriend. I think we were about to fall asleep. He was going to vo vote for um, whoever the libertarian candidate was. And I don't know why I can't remember his name. I was going to vote for Jill Stein because I was just an idiot. I had Me no too. idea. And he was like, I don't know. Oh, my God. We were like, we should, like, get a friendship bracelet or something. Because I was like, all right. I wasn't jazzed about Hi Hillary. But I also, Trump was total evil. So I was like, okay. Let me. I thought I was, like, making a difference. <laughs> um, yeah. And I said to my boyfriend, I was like, would you rather vote for, Trump? have you gone to your head, Hillary or Trump? Who would, and he was like, Trump. And I was like, oh, I was like so mad. I like turned over in bed. I just like didn't talk to him for the rest of the night. I was like very mad. And I, and I looking back, it's like, oh, I was, I was brainwashed. Like I was, I was drinking the Kool-Aid on all that because there, I was not researching or looking into anything. And now I'm only slightly looking into things. So I was just I was believing what I was what fed and what I was told. It slightly makes though, right? Because then you start to see things like, oh, yeah, like I didn't, even even investigating slightly is better than not at all. And most people, I'm starting to realize, it seems like most people just get their opinions that way. Oh. They just get their received opinions, but you feel them deeply because they are emotionally programmed. You're emotionally, you were emotionally programmed to when he said, I'm going to vote for this candidate. You were like, <laughs> oh my god and that was before i knew about any of the hillary stuff i just like kind of didn't like her i didn't know i didn't know anything um so it's really crazy how you can change in just a few years but i think what what walk away did so beautifully and it was just like brandon strock being like the face of it being a gay man like it it was just it provided uh another way you know and i think a lot of folks like i don't know women or lgbt folks it's like almost like you can't, you can't walk away. Who are you going to go to? You're not going to be accepted on the right or by conservatives or even in the yeah. center. So I think, I mean, it really actually, groundbreaking stuff. Yeah, I agree. Well, it gave everyone who was walking away individually and maybe feeling alone in their life, like losing friends, going through that isolation, mm -hmm. gave them a way to find one another. And some of the uh, walk away things I did attend were just beautiful because you've got people there, like you said, and a lot, very diverse group of people in all the, di in all the ways that the left claims to about claims to care about diversity. They're diverse in those ways, racially, you know, in terms of sexuality and, and, and sex and um, just having a place for those people to find one another. But there, but there definitely is a way to walk away that doesn't include even doing what I did, like voting for Trump or becoming part of like the Republican party, which I, I did not do that. And and I know people who've walked away that like there are liberals who speak out against social justice ideology and and get called right wing and get called all these names who are not right wing. I mean, you look at someone like Brett Weinstein, professor, he's progressive. He's an actual progressive who calls out social justice ideology, but mm. he gets called, even he gets called right wing by people. But but he's not on the Trump train. You know, there are people I, I really want when, whenever we do. Sometimes I, for, I forget this and I really want whenever we do our episodes to keep in mind that that sometimes there are, are people on the left who are hate watching us. Hmm. But we're starting <laughs> hey guys. To <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Every view counts. We appreciate yeah. you. I really appreciate my downvote trolls. I'm like, hey, at least you're here. And I know for a fact that some of them are now fans. I've met them. And so I know that at any given moment, there might be someone hate watching who's starting to agree <laughs> with certain things we're saying. And I'm like, you don't have to be scared. You don't have to get on the uh, Republican train or whatever. You just need to be a liberal or a progressive who speaks up against things that are not liberal and progressive, like social justice ideology. <laughs> you can stay a liberal. You can stay a progressive. You can stay, you know, uh, yeah, you can you can get off one train doesn't mean you have to get on another train. You can just right. walk. I don't know. You can just take a yeah. scooter, take a bike. <laughs> I don't know. I always I do a terrible metaphor every episode. Like um, but yeah, for anyone hate watching this thing is like I would love to talk to you because I don't have all the answers either. I think it's I think the powers that be very much want us not talking to each other yes. and they want us in our bubbles and uh, they want us hating each other so that we maybe don't realize <laughs> Maybe we should be hating them. Maybe we should be learning how to like take down the power or, you know, maybe realizing, oh, this is more of a class issue than a race issue. Yeah. Well, look at what they did, Chrissy, to Occupy Wall Street. So Occupy Wall Street was something that, you know, originated on the left, but it, it, it's something that even people, that people on the right can identify with as well. You know, you're being against corruption, against, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, oligarchies and it's, and it's what they did with that. And when I look at it in retrospect is they made it seem like crazy to the right, to anyone on the right, they made sure to make it look like crazy leftists, you know, just wow. out of their mom's basement so that people on the right would denigrate it and not get involved in it. And then what did they do? The, you know what tore apart Occupy Wall Street from the inside out was social justice. It, it became about wow. who's more oppressed, whose race, what race are you? What gender are you? What sexuality are yeah, you? And it the oppression Olympics, it. like the triangle, yes. like the, uh, yeah, exactly. Yes, like how many oppression it. points can you claim? You're like, oh, damn it. I'm not yeah. in a wheelchair or else I'd be there. Yeah. Or else I'd be at the top. And yeah. then they did the same thing in the tea party because I was, I was squarely on that social justice left. And I remember the messaging I was getting about the tea party was, they did the same thing, but they flipped it. They're like, hey, people on the mm. left should know that the Tea Party is just a bunch of crazy right winger conspiracy theorists out of their mom's basement. It was the same thing, so that you're not everyone's in a basement. Yeah, that's what we yeah. all have in common. <laughs> involved. And that's what I think that's what both sides do. If they can just disregard you because of your character, because it's like, oh, you look this way, or oh, you have blue hair and tattoos, you're this type, or you're in camo and with an American flag and you have a pickup truck truck, you're this type. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh okay, types can be useful, but we always have to watch like when you're typing somebody, you know, yeah. uh, and using that as a, it's tricky. Cause like sometimes stereotypes are good and they help us avoid trouble or sometimes our gut instincts, instincts are good. But um, I think that's what both sides are guilty of. Like, oh, you look this way, you're this type. I can disregard you and not listen to you. I like playing with um, stereotypes. You You probably do this because you're a comedian in some ways naturally on stage. But I like, I was at the dog park the other day and there's this guy who, I'm here, I'm in Texas. There's this guy who, if you were just looking at him, the media, whoever they would think, oh, he's deplorable. He's wearing okay. like an army, uh, an old army jacket. He's, he's, you know, like a good old boy, older dude. And he starts talking to me cause I'm wearing, I'm, I was wearing my dad's army fatigues, but. <laughs> you're there I to pick often, up dudes at the dog yeah. park. <laughs> but he starts talking to me and he's like talking about the army fatigues and stuff. And then, and then we were talking about the recent ice storm here and his plumbing issues and everything. And he was talking about some guy at home Depot who was buying up all the plumbing supplies so he could sell them at a premium. Wow. And said, yeah. And he said, greed, it's just greed, ain't it? And he's like, you know, I thought we would have got rid of this once we got rid of that president. And so I, Interesting. I, just, so I just immediately said, Oh, Obama. And he was like, no, <laughs> That's awesome. And then and he's like, Trump. And so we had this moment where we just start talking. And I realized to any outsider, I get pegged as a social justice leftist still all the time, maybe the way I dress or whatever. And they just, people just make assumptions about me. And he probably, people, a lot of people make assumptions about him. And here we are having the wow. exact opposite uh, conversation. It was kind of funny. I and like you it. fell in love. Fun. And then we <laughs> fell in love. Yeah. Weddings next month. <laughs> That is fascinating. Yeah, well, I was in Dallas a couple weeks ago too. Like, I think uh, I was there for the uh, the blackouts and the snow. Oh, and you came at the worst time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was there okay. Sunday. I got there like Sunday the fourteenth, and then stayed actually till two the following Tuesday because I tried to make up the the couple of appearances that I missed because I went on uh, a bunch of Blaze shows. Um, and yeah, it was it was an adventure. Like I think the, you really learn a lot about yourself when the power goes out, and, you know, and then when it comes back on, you're like, "All right, you can either shower or you can heat something up for food." You know, <laughs> can't do both. It makes you more grateful afterwards. Oh, for sure, absolutely. And uh, I just was, I don't know, I was happy to be there because like my hotel bed was warm. I was like, okay, worst case scenario, I'll just get in bed and yeah. read. You know, <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, that's what I noticed about being in Dallas and I was doing shows at Hyenas. I thought that the crowds would be more right leaning. And then I was like, what do you guys think of Ted Cruz? They're like, boo. And I was like, oh, cool. Right. This is, this is a big city. This is Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. It's really different. Texas is changing um, quite a bit. I mean, my county, Williamson County went blue this past election, which is unusual for mm. my county. Um, so there's a lot of people moving here, of course, in California and New York. And I think that contributes to some degree because people, even though they will have conversations with you about how they left California because they they couldn't afford to live there anymore, it's almost this disconnect where sometimes people don't realize 
maybe it's the policies that I vote for that make things unlivable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Are you not with me or not? I don't know. I right? could see a world in which Texas becomes very blue and Florida becomes very red. Like, I just think that because Florida is like, I think a lot of New Yorkers, um, I, I think New Yorkers that are, that are liberal are more afraid to go to go to Florida than Californians are to go to Texas. Yeah, you're right. You're probably right. But we'll see what happens. I like I know I've been seeing like funny shirts like keep your California out of my Texas and stuff like yeah. that. Like keep your New York out of my Florida. And I'm like, hey, can't wait to do comedy for you guys. <laughs> it's tricky. It's tricky on like on stage, you know, because like I've never had a ton of political jokes, but I'm always it's my job to like charm everyone, entertain everyone. It's my job to like be a good time. So it's like I don't want to alienate anybody. And that's the thing is like, I'm not there to like change anybody's minds. I just, I, I guess I'm like not that kind of comic. I just like want people to have fun and Wait laugh. Are and you la there to make people laugh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so, you know, even if I was, maybe if I was the type of person that really loved debate and loved to like, ch you know, change minds and prove myself, like maybe, but. I, so I have to just be careful. Like, okay, what are people laughing at at the comics before me? How are they leaning? You know, well, I admire that, Chrissy, because that's sort of, I mean, that's that's the function of comedy. Should be the number one function is to make people laugh. It doesn't mean you can't make people think or think about your issue or your belief system, whatever it is. But your number one priority should be comedy. And the thing about fundamentalist ideologies is when they move into it. A field or if they possess a person that they, they it tends to become the number one priority so i've had actually social justice people argue with me about about snl and say well it doesn't matter if that sketch is funny or not beca because the because because it's is important right. Ugh. Yeah. it's like no it does matter if it's funny that should be the number that's the number one thing that matters and then if yeah. you want to preach to me, that can be secondary but once your preaching becomes like the number one priority you've got your your priorities backwards and so Absolutely. I admire that. Yeah. I, you make me think of one of my favorites since I was a child is um, I just saw this in the, in the news yesterday. Dolly Parton is now being attacked by woke people for, um, for not telling us all of her political opinions explicitly and for just trying to entertain us. And Oh um, God, God forbid somebody <laughs> do their job, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah. So, and I just, I was thinking about that over the past day or so. Like, it's like this um, forcing of choose a side. It's like, literally you have a gun to your head. Where are you going to go, Dolly? <laughs> yeah. I just, I love, I love that about her that she's just always been able to put music first. And if she has opinions, she'll share little things here and there, but she's not, she's not a fundamentalist. She's not out there telling you, here's how I'm voting. Here's how you should vote, you know? And, I love that about her. And so you go to a Dolly concert and you've got like um, drag queens and gay couples and conservative Christian evangelicals all rubbing shoulders and nobody cares. It's wow. Like everybody's just. That's great. And, and so I would like to have that. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like I've like, I have a feeling I've lost like all my gay friends sort of in my walking away transition time but like i what really sticks out is like i had this very good gay friend like he did he did my show wet spot a bunch um he did like other little podcasts and then i just saw him like talking shit on twitter this was like months ago but of course it's still wow. like hurts like oh like calling me a like a like a like i don't know a conservative mouthpiece or something like and i'm like man like i don't get it like it, it just really blows so it sucks. look hey it's like leaving any cult I, I totally want to have you on our show if you would come. Yes. Because uh, I want to talk about this with you more but and I hear about your story. But that happened to me several times over. Yeah, you, you will lose you will lose some friendships won't hurt as much because they're more like acquaintance friendships. And some close right. ones that you thought would survive don't survive. But you also will make new friends, as I'm sure you have. And, you will, and then you will find some of the people who have been acquaintances in your life, maybe more background characters, will become stronger friends because they'll reach out and they're like, what's going on with you? Like, I'm really suddenly very interested. And so I've, it's just, I wouldn't trade any of it. Like even the things that I've lost by saying what I believe to be true, um, 
they don't compare to the things that you gain. And, and whenever I talk to people or especially to liberals who are afraid um, and, and there are still several people in the entertainment industry who will call me and want to have private conversations mm -hmm. about their fear and talk through things and uh, who like the kind of stuff I share, but are too afraid to hit like, you know, oh, the, isn't that horrible? Yeah. And I've heard that from so many people. And, like, I, I don't want to get fired or I don't want to be ostracized from my friend group. Cause if you know, I, I'm being afraid to like something, man, that, yeah. and if, if that, that's just like, if that's what they're saying to you, imagine how constricted the rest of their life might feel. Yeah. But as they, I always say to them, if you get over that fear, I'm telling you, and everybody does it at their own time frame. Mm -hmm. But if you get past it, you, I think you will find that when you look back, it's it's so worth it because you can't put a price on that freedom of being able to say what you think. And when I was a social justice warrior, it's like I had a I had a internal censor in my head. I censored mm. myself. Wow, it's, it's cult to do that. They get you. They're very good at um, controlling language, which controls thought. And so anytime I was posting something or you know, I'd run it through the filter and I wasn't saying one of the many problematic words or that it, I, it couldn't possibly mis be misinterpreted as being um, impure ideologically. Hmm. And so that when you're doing that, you're, you're not really thinking, you're not thinking, you're just going through a, a filing cabinet of, of all the tenets of the belief system and making sure that what you're about to say, that might be a sort of an original thought gets filtered through so that it's not misconstrued in any way to be to be pro problematic. So it's like, like you, stripping yeah. It. yeah, stripping you it of things. You think an original thought, you're like, well, this doesn't fit. So this must be a wrong thought. So yeah. I have to like dismiss this. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Horrible. it's tricky and you don't see it coming. It's just like it creeps up on you. And like what you were saying about the Dolly Parton fans, like to me, that's just okay. They're just looking for somebody to kick out because it's like, oh, you haven't told us your views, which must means you're an enemy. Like, yeah. out, out with it. You know, they're not saying that of someone they're kind of fond of that they're like, ah, I have a feeling she loves the gays. She's probably on our side. Let's go on with our lives. It's like, nope. Like, show us, show us your hand. Yeah. Ugh, that's so. It's icky. not enough. You have to. You have to uh, pledge alle allegiance to the religion. It's a. It's. It functions a lot like a religion. You have to have that moment publicly, Dolly. They want you to have that moment where you come to social Jesus. Hmm. You walk down the aisle at church and you confess your white privilege. And you do, you know, like they want you to have that conversion moment. Yeah, that was so hard for me to do. Like a big moment for me was like the day that everyone had to do the black square. And I was like, I guess I'm going to. No, I don't want to do this. Why do I have to do a black square so that everybody in my life can know I'm a good person? Like I just. Yeah. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I was like, if this is what I need to do, then like, I guess I'm out. I guess I'm a terrible person. Cause it's like, <laughs> now it's like, if this is what is ugh, like, what's next? Like do, do I have to do something every month, every week, you know, uh, then it's like your, your feed is not your own anymore. Yes. And they own you. Yeah. Especially what you were saying about that. There were liberals, not only cheering on censorship and defending violence, but like you had this post of somebody that was like, kill they were saying kill basically everybody in trump's cabinet like and i'm like looking down I'm like oh yeah this is a facebook post that like probably didn't get taken down or they didn't get banned and uh and you said that there were folks like laughing at the escalating suicide rates and addiction rates of the white working class yeah which is yeah i started wild. to notice that after right around the 2016 election there were a lot of uh pieces that were written and so I had whittled my world down to just social justice people, my online world. I mean, it was very um, specific and it, it even, I would exclude, you know, liberals um, who didn't share these like very fundamentalist kind of social justice beliefs. And so anyway, in my echo chamber, a lot of people started sharing these opinion pieces about how, um, you know, why you should not have empathy for Trump voters. And I'm like, wait, what? We're, we're, and, and that was one of the times where I started to see through the matrix, mm. I guess. You'd say. So like, why are, why are all these pieces telling me not to have empathy? <gasps> and wow. Are yeah. Not to have empathy. And, uh, and then I was also seeing, like you said, people laughing and sort of, uh, uh, just callously reacting to stories about the escalating addiction rates and in, in books like Hill, Hillbilly Elegy that that delved into um, 
problems in the in the white working class. It's sort of viewed as like, well, good. I hope all these white people die soon. This sort of idea. I I saw that same thing in my in my circles when um when the cop shootings happened at the Black Lives Matter rally in Dallas, and those cops were killed by the sniper. Uh, there were people in my circles who were kind of tacitly in, endorsing that, like celebrating it. Like a lot of white people are going to have, a lot of old white men are going to have to die. I heard that phrase. Oh yeah. Oh, so much hate on the mm -hmm. old white men. And it's like, you know what? Like who, who built the house you're living in? <laughs> like probably an old white man, you know, like you wouldn't be here if it weren't for some old white man's splooge. Okay. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're not all bad. Like every generation kind of has like their lessons. And if anything, I'm jealous of the baby boomers for kind of having it so easy to like get a house and, uh, yeah, you know, just be adults. They kind of had a leg up, it seems. But yeah, I, I remember a lot of that. Like it's these old white men. And it's just like even true. Some of those cops were black and they're, they weren't all, old. you know what I mean? Like they don't, they just sort of reduce it down to this thing. Sorry. I didn't. And you laugh. You, it's like, I laugh at that. It's like, come on, man. Like even in 2021, look at who is in charge of things. It's Bill Gates. It's, it's Bezos. It's like everybody on the, like whatever economic world economic forum, all, all the gl like globalist type people, they're all white. It's, it's like, you're not, it's, and then the rest is just show and BS and what's on the commercials and, and like the face, the, the face of the pamphlet. Right. Um, it's just like it's there's so much pandering it's like you don't see gates or bezos being like you know what i'm gonna give my job to a black woman <laughs> i'm <laughs> come on man it's like i've had a good run yeah <laughs> it's noise none it's of it due to me all due to my privilege right <clears throat> yeah so it's like okay how do you how do you try to just get what you want within this system and uh and realize it's it's probably better than than other countries you know if they keep us fighting, and when I say they, I just mean the elite, the actual powerful, the media, the elite in the in the political parties, both parties. If they keep us fighting all the time about these things that don't matter really that much, like are you on the right or are you on the left or are you a Republican or are you a Democrat or what race are you or what sex are you, what sexuality, if they keep us fighting in these ridiculous um, binaries that they've made us think are so important, then we don't unite and we don't actually talk about the, the privileges that give people more power. Okay. If you're, if you're actually for social justice and you believe the best way to look at the world is as a power struggle mm. and for, for, you know, between identity groups um, and you're, and you're committed to thinking of it that way. Well, I would say maybe broaden your perspective a little bit to say, what if it's not about identity groups? What if it's about um, these other ways in which like, look at who has the most power. It's not this whole white male thing that they're telling you it is. It's right. Cause a um, lot of white males are struggling. Like they, at this yeah. point for years, they've been hearing that they ain't shit <laughs> and the future is female and nobody cares what a white man has to think or say like, that's pretty ingrained. I think like dudes have been hearing that for like, a good maybe eight years at this point. Right. It's, it's just, it's just this sort of uh, keep people fighting over these imagined, these, these blown out of proportion differences so that they don't actually uh, complain about the fed or don't actually complain about us getting further into debt as a country and saddling their grandchildren with debt. And so they don't actually complain about, bailing out corporations mm -hmm. um, or, you know, any of the things that we should be focusing on, we we're not focusing on the dollar in our pocket is worth less every day. <laughs> and, and every time they do another trillion dollar pack, it's a stimulus package that mostly bails out corporations. They're stealing money out of your pocket because they're making that dollar that you already own worth less money. And we don't talk about these things. Because that's a big problem. It's so much easier yeah. to just call somebody a Nazi. <laughs> yeah, it's much better. They're like, oh, you know what you should really be fighting about? What race you all are. Like, keep fighting about that. The most baseline, and, yeah, basic yeah. stuff. Uh, I, yeah, I feel like we've all been tricked. Yeah. I feel tricked. I don't know. I feel tricked by being like a liberal. I feel kind of tricked by feminism. Like, I had the same kind of like busting out moment yeah. too like i just was like oh like we're all like we need each other like it's okay 
<sighs> well, I'm very happy I got to meet you. This was great. <laughs> yeah. This is so great. I feel like we still have so much more to talk about. But I feel like we've solved the world's problems for now. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, um, where can people find you, follow you? I wanted to bring up your civility dinners. Oh, yeah. um, so I don't know if you want to like talk briefly about that stuff and then just where everybody can find you. Well, if you are in the Austin area and you want to come to a civility dinner, you can hit me up, uh, civilitydinner.com. Uh, the uh, unsafespace.com is our, our website for our podcast. We do a book club, like I mentioned before. It's free to join and participate. Um, you, If you want to be a part of it, just go to our book club page and it'll tell you what book we're reading right now. Um, we, uh, the civility dinners are something I started before on safe space. Actually, I was trying to, I wanted to meet some conservatives. <laughs> I didn't know any really at the time. And so you I just started, go to a home Depot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, hey, but like I recently <laughs> found out, I can't always judge a book by its camera. True. So true. Color. Uh, but so I, I started doing these dinners and we, we get together, we have people on the right and the left in between people who want to have conversations with those who have different political opinions. And we just have, we have dinner and we have good fun. And, um, uh, uh, if, if you're in the Austin area, let me know. I heard that you're going to be back in Austin in May. So let me yes. know. I would love to meet you in person. May 14th and 15th. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to plug myself again. Yeah. Convenes of the compound <laughs> somewhere. It will be somewhere in Austin, but yeah, I would cool. love to meet you. Uh, awesome. yeah, for sure. We could have a civility dinner or a civility lunch yes. or a civility cup of coffee somewhere. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Um, Carrie Smith, thank, thank you so much for your time. You're fascinating. I, I like love seeing how many similarities we have and, and, uh, it's great. Now we've broken out of the mold. Who knows? Who knows what's next? <laughs> Maybe uh, I'll buy some crypto coin. Probably not because I'm scared of that stuff. Okay. Okay. I'll do it right now. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> Bye.